In this video, I'm going to work some Mendelian genetics problems along with some problems that don't follow our regular Mendelian genetics patterns and then some sex linked trait problems. So this is probably going to be a long video. Feel free to watch this in segments. Feel free to pause it, work them on your own and whatnot. There is an assignment in Blackboard for this chapter that you will need to complete. There are also additional practice problems um, that are not graded at the end of that assignment and there are more problems for practice that are posted on Blackboard under this chapter. So there's a lot of ways that you can practice these things. So let's work by start out by working a simple Punnett square problem. Now we are going to look at seed color in Mendel's pea plants where yellow is the dominant trait and green is the recessive. So that capital Y allele is going to indicate yellow. The lowercase is going to indicate green. Now remember, if it is recessive, we need two copies of that allele to make a green phenotype. All right, so let's start with our parent generation, our parental generation, or our P generation just like Mendel did. So Mendel crossed true breeding plants. Those are plants that always produce the same offspring no matter how many times they are crossed. Um, so true breeding yellow plants will always produce yellow because they only have the yellow allele. And true breeding green will only ever produce the green plant because they only have the green allele. So if we cross our true breeding parents, Let's first start by making our gametes. So in meiosis, this individual can produce a gamete with a big Y or with a big Y. This individual can produce a gamete with a little Y or a little Y. Those are the only two options. So if one of the eggs from this individual is fertilized by a sperm from this individual, those are the potential offspring that you can get. So let's move this over to a Punnett square. All we do is move our potential gametes to the Punnett square and then we perform our cross. So for this cross, we are going to get only heterozygous individuals. We are going to get four heterozygous to zero homozygous of either kind, okay? We are going to get four yellow individuals and zero green individuals. So for all of your problems, you need to give me the genotype ratio and the phenotype ratio. Now I say this for all the problems, um, if it doesn't tell you what question to answer, assume that you're giving the genotype and phenotype ratios. If it asks you something else, make sure that you answer that question. So if this question said, perform the cross between homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive individuals and state the percentage of offspring that's going to be yellow, well then you would answer that question. The percentage of offspring that's going to be yellow is 100%. So you have to pay attention to what question you're being answered. And then because you're gonna be working out your problems, please put a box or a circle around your answer so that I know that you know what question you are answering. Most of the problems are going to be answering similar questions, but just make sure you are paying attention to what is actually being asked. So let's move over to our next cross. In this cross, we are gonna cross these individuals here. These are the F1 generation, or the first filial generation. So for our F1 cross, we are going to cross these two individuals. Now, you might self-pollinate these guys, which means they're being pollinated by their own um, gametes. Um, or you might cross with two plants that are produced from a different parent but are also the same F1 genotype. So we are going to cross our heterozygous individuals from that F1 generation. Again, let's look at our gametes. This individual could produce gametes that are big Y or little y. This individual could produce gametes that are big Y or little y. 
So if we transfer those to a Punnett square, we've got our heterozygous from one parent, heterozygous from the other. Now we see something different. We have a homozygous dominant individual, two heterozygous individuals, and one homozygous recessive. So again, look back at the question. Our question says, what are the genotype and phenotype ratios? Our genotype ratios are gonna be one homozygous dominant to two heterozygous to one homozygous recessive. These individuals here are all gonna be yellow because they have the dominant allele. This one here is going to be green because it is two recessive alleles. So for our phenotypic ratio, we have three yellow to one green. Now let's look at our last cross. These individuals, actually before we do our last cross, these individuals here in this Punnett square that we just did are going to be our F2 generation or the second filial generation, the product of the F1 parents. So I'm going to go ahead and clear all the ink on this slide and then we'll work our last problem. So this last problem, this is just another example. We are crossing a heterozygous yellow with a homozygous green. So again, let's start out by making our gametes. So this individual can produce a dominant or a recessive gamete. This individual can only produce recessive gametes. So let's put those on the Punnett square so we can determine all possible combinations of our offspring. This individual is gonna be heterozygous, as is this one. These two are gonna be homozygous. So in this case, we have two heterozygous to two homozygous individuals, or half of our individuals are gonna be heterozygous, half of our individuals are gonna be homozygous. For phenotype, we have two yellow to two green. That means that half will be yellow, half will be green. Now, in general, I would like you to reduce your ratios. Um, I won't necessarily take off points for this if you don't, but it does make uh, grading a little bit easier. If everybody reduces, then I know everybody's on the same page. All right, so let's look at a test cross. A test cross allows you to determine the unknown genotype of a dominant individual. So if you have a dominant phenotype, you could be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So a test cross allows you to work back from the offspring that you have to see what the genotype of the parents are. So let's say we have a plant that produces white flowers and a plant that produces purple flowers. Now white flowers are recessive, so we're gonna call this the little p allele. Purple flowers are dominant, so we're gonna call that the big p allele. Those purple flowers could either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So we know that the white flower is recessive. So we know that any flower or any plant that is white is going to have that homozygous recessive genotype. Now, if you have a purple flower and you want to determine what genotype it is, you can cross that purple that you don't know with the white because you always know the recessive genotype. So there are two possibilities here. You can have the purple flower that is big P, big P, and cross that with the white flower. Or your plant could be big P, little P, and cross that with the white flower. Now, you don't know what it is, but when you cross it, you're going to get a set of offspring. And then you're going to look and see whether those offspring follow the expected pattern for homozygous cross or an expected pattern for the heterozygous cross. Now, if you do this, if your plant is the homozygous dominant plant, all of the individuals from this cross are gonna be big P, little p. And you can pause and do the Punnett square if you would like. So if all offspring 
are purple because that heterozygous genotype makes a purple phenotype, then you know the parent was big P, big P. Now, this cross over here, if we do this cross in a Punnett square, this is the one where we get 50, 50, 50% 50 purple and 50% white. So if the offspring are 50% white, or 50% of them are white, and 50% of them are purple, then you know that that purple flower was heterozygous. So this one, you have to look at what offspring you have before you can determine the phenotype. But once you know the ratios of the offspring, then you can work backwards to determine which phenotype you have. I'm sorry, which genotype you have. All right, so let's move on to a dihybrid cross example. And remember, a dihybrid cross is demonstrating the law of independent assortment. This is the law that says that two genes alleles, the alleles from two different genes, will separate into gametes independent of one another. That means you can get any combination of Y with any combination of R. The first thing we're going to do for this is we are going to use our math friend FOIL to determine which gamete possibilities we can have. So let's start. I'm going to FOIL it. Actually, I'm not going to FOIL it yet. Um, we're going to FOIL our gamete so determine which gamete combinations we can make. We're going to set up a Punnett square. This is going to be a 4 by 4 Punnett square. Then after we do our cross, we are going to list the phenotypes that are produced. Now, in order to do this, you must understand how to interpret the genotypes that you have in order to get the correct phenotype. So let's go back to our yellow and green seed color in our peas. This time we're going to add round and wrinkled. So we're going to look at all the combinations of color and texture for these seeds that you could get. Um, before we do that, one more thing. Law of independent assortment applies to two genes on two different chromosomes. All right, so let's do this cross. So the first thing we're going to do is foil our gametes. So each of these parents are actually going to be the same, so I'm only going to do this once. But each parent, because they are both double heterozygous, are going to produce the same type of gametes. So our first gamete combination is YR. Our second one, our outer combination, is big Y, little r. I'll make it cursive. Our third possibility is little y, big R. And our fourth possibility is little y, little r. Now, these individuals, or this individual is going to pr produce the same gametes. So we'll just rewrite them. If you want to practice foiling, you can pause and do that now. All right, so we have our gamete possibilities here. I am setting up our Punnett square as we speak. So you should always ask yourself, am I looking at two different traits? If the answer is yes, you should have a 16 square Punnett square. If you say, yes, I am looking at two traits, and you set up a four by four Punnett square, you are doing it wrong. This is the most common mistake that students make. If you have two traits, 
two different genes with two different alleles, you are making gametes that are combos of both of those alleles. So if your answer comes out to be this, you are doing the problem wrong. And I'm going to say that again. If you have two different traits, such as seed color and seed texture, you have to have a four by four square with combinations of both of those traits. All of the individuals inside your Punnett square should have four alleles. If they don't, you will get this problem wrong. It happens every semester and students come and ask me why they missed it. And it's because they did not make their gamete combinations with both genes. Some students get this right away. They never make this mistake, but some students make this mistake the whole time. So pay attention to what you are being asked to do. All right, so I am off my soapbox now. Let's go through this Punnett square. So we are gonna make our combos. And when you do this, please write your Y alleles together and your R alleles together. This will be easier for interpreting it in a little bit. So I'm just gonna go down. It's sort of like filling out a multiplication table. We're just gonna combine our alleles. We're gonna write the dominant allele first, just by convention. So continuing to fill this out, it just gets a little bit tedious. It's not hard. Just go slowly, make sure you don't make any typos. Make sure I'm not making any typos if I'm doing this in class or in a video. All right, so we have this all filled out. Let's go through and assign our genotypes. All right, so this first box, yellow and round, yellow and round, yellow and round, yellow and round. This is because there is at least one dominant allele for yellow and one dominant allele for round. Let's continue, yellow and round, yellow and round. All right, so we should have nine yellow and round. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine yellow and round. Uh, we also, so I'm gonna do this one in orange just to make it look different. We also have yellow and wrinkled. Yellow and wrinkled, yellow and wrinkled, yellow and wrinkled. It's because we have a dominant yellow allele, but no dominant round alleles. So we have the two recessive wrinkled alleles. So three yellow and wrinkled. All right, so I have two greens here, so I will do the green ones now. These guys are gonna be green because they are homozygous recessive. Green and round, green and round, green and round. So three green and round. And then last one is one green and wrinkled. Now, you will probably recognize this ratio. This ratio is really important. This is our dihybrid ratio for two heterozygotes. This will not always happen, but it will always happen if you are crossing two individuals who are heterozygous for two traits. And remember this one because this one is an important one, okay? So let's do another example. We are going to cross um, individual plants who are, and we are gonna look at um, size, their height, and the shape of their leaves. So tall is going to be dominant to dwarf or short. Uh, normal is going to be 
dominant to elongated. So elongated means stretched out so long and thin. So we have two traits and two alleles each. So this is going to be our big die hybrid cross. So we're going to set up that four by four Punnett square. Remember the first thing we're gonna do is foil our gametes. So let's go to the next page. Now we need to foil two different gametes here. So parent one first, so gamete one, outer, gamete two, inner, gamete three, and last, gamete four. If you would like to write out your gametes so you know what's going on and draw them as little sperm or eggs, you are welcome to do that. Um, I will leave that up to you. The other one, going to be D, D, E, E. So you probably can guess what's going on here. First, D, E, outer, inner, and last. They're gonna be all exactly the same. This individual can only produce one type of gamete. Now if you look over here, this individual actually can only produce two types of gametes. So if it makes sense to you, you can only fill out the singles, so you could fill out this, this one and this one because the other ones are just duplicates and if we're reducing anyway, we don't have to do all of them. But, so you can see the process, I'm going to write out all of these. So big D, little d, big E, little e. Same thing all the way down because this parent over here has the same gametes. All right, over here, big D, little d, big E, little e. This is the same as over here. So we're just gonna continue. All right, over here we have a new one. Little d, little d, big D, little d. Same thing all the way down. And then here it's gonna be the same as this column. So again, if you can see the multiples and you can see that they're the same, you do not necessarily have to write these out. But you still need to write your ratios. All right, so these plants over here are all going to be tall with normal leaves. So we've got eight, tall and normal and over on the other side we've got dwarf size with normal leaves so all eight of these are going to be dwarf and normal notice that this is a dihybrid cross but it is not follow that nine to three to three to one that's because our combinations up here is different notice also that there are no little e, little e combo. So we have no uh, elongated leaves from this uh, particular cross. Now you can practice these all you want by just making up combinations of dominant and heterozygous and recessive. Um, you can make up uh, two allele or two gene combinations and just practice these to your heart's content. You don't even have to necessarily assign phenotype. You could just say eight dominant, dominant to eight dominant recessive or whatever when you fill out your phenotype, phenotypes or you could make up phenotypes if it helps you. All right, let's go through some probability rules. So. Probability rules govern our inheritance, and that's because by chance, each of your gametes gets a particular allele. So there is a 50% chance of getting the first allele, there's a 50% chance of getting the second allele. And then for the other parent, they have 50-50 as well. And so you get, there are probabilities that are associated with receiving these traits. So this is like a coin toss. Um, one coin toss, if you flip the coin once, has no effect on what's going to happen next. If you flip it 100 times, you would expect there to be 50% heads and 50% tails. Is it always 
No, sometimes you get a little off. Maybe you get 48 and 52, something like that. But um, for now, and for this class, we are gonna assume that you get what you expect. Um, so this is um, demonstrating the law of segregation, which is where your alleles separate into gametes, separate gametes during meiosis. So the probability of any gamete getting big A is one half or 50%. The probability of any gamete getting little a is one half. Probabilities all equal one. So the chance of getting either of these is going to be one. You have to get one of them. All right, so let's say we cross two heterozygous individuals. What is the chance or what is the probability of getting little p, little p? Well, the chance of this individual passing on a little p is one half. The chance of this individual passing on a little p is one half. So we are going to use the law of multiplication, which says that the chance of any two events occurring together is the product of each individual event. So product means multiply. So the chance of being little p, little p is one half times one half, which is one quarter. We could also say what is the probability of being uh, homozygous dominant? Again, the chance of getting a big P is one half. The chance of getting a big P from the other parent is one half, okay? So multiplication rule says probability that two or more independent events will occur together is the product of their individual probability. So let's flip two coins. What is the probability that both will land on heads? Well, the chance of coin, the probability of coin one on heads is one half. The probability of coin two on heads is one half. So the probability of two independent events occurring together is the product of their individual probabilities. So the probability of two heads is going to be one half times one half, which equals one fourth. All right, so let's look at the second example. If two parents are heterozygous, what is the probability they will have an affected child that is a boy? So probability, or I'm sorry, let's say they are both heterozygous. Probability they will have an affected child that is a boy. So we can do this two ways. I'm gonna walk you through two ways. The first way is we can just look at this cross and you can say well there is a half chance of this parent passing on the little p there is a one half chance of this parent passing on the little p and there is a one half chance of that child being a boy so the probability of an affected boy is one half times one half times one half which is one eighth. The other thing we can do, and you can do it however you would like, is to draw out the Punnett square. So from the Punnett square, we can see that the probability of being affected is one fourth, and the probability of being a boy because you just know the chance of being boy if it's 50% is a half. So either way, we get to 1 eighth. So you can do it either way, whichever way you are comfortable with. Just make sure you're paying attention to the question and um, answering what they are asking for.